hi, and welcome to another episode of Aging Intelligently. Today, we are going to talk about how to fail at estate planning if you have a child on public benefits. Right. And this is specifically dealing with adult disabled children or any disabled child. Uh, what I was thinking about when I wrote the, the episode was more adult disabled children uh, because they're on their own. You know, their, 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 their qualification for benefits and their eligibility is based on their assets and, and things like that. But uh, to a degree, it would work. We have a lot of people that may have special needs grandchildren, and we have to make that planning as well for them when they're doing their estate planning. So it could go for each, but this basically this episode is focusing on the adult disabled child. Okay. And, and specifically because we recently did have a child. Uh, situation like this that caused an awful lot of problems. Right. So what exactly do you mean? What kind of public benefits would an adult disabled child have access to normally? Well, a lot of times if uh, it could be disability and all the public benefits that goes along with that, but what you see most often, yeah, that's what I was going to say. What you see most often is the adult disabled child frequently will not have enough credits to qualify for disability. Because they didn't work. That's right. Or they they didn't work enough to qualify. So that that will put them into uh, SSI, supplementary supplementary security income, Medicaid, uh, what people normally refer to as food stamps, you know, the the, uh, EBT payments, uh, different things like that. And it could go into, for those that are, more disabled, it could be into, you know, uh, mental health programs, intellectually disabled programs and things like that, that they qualify for through their community services board. Okay. And what happened, what happened in this case? Well, the first case that I was thinking about was one that, that, that I call the princess turned a pauper. Uh, in this case, I knew a gentleman, he was, he was a client of the firm, but he had done relatively you know, straightforward estate planning. He didn't do anything uh, advanced at the time, even though I encouraged him to because he had an adult disabled child. We have several clients who have adult disabled children. And yes. Some of them are very uh, proactive in that they have done their will. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've done powers of attorney. They've made their wishes known. But... Right. They, they don't go the extra step and they, they don't create a, a special needs trust for the child. Before uh, they die. Right. In this so case. they might put it in the provisions of the will. Right. But in this case, what the gentleman had done is he had simply made his sister uh, the beneficiary of his accounts as payable on death. She was POD designated on the accounts. Uh, and I had heard from other people that he felt that his sister would do the right thing uh, for her niece. So they, there was a couple who he was living, he was a widower. He was a widower. And so he had one adult disabled child. And so he's leaving everything in the will to the sister because she's going to do the right thing to take care of the. Right. He didn't even leave it in the will. He left the POD. Oh, okay. So on it's outright to the sister. Right. Uh, Nothing what, to the child. What the sister considered the right thing to do was she closed the accounts, took the money and went back home to Northern Virginia. And, and abandoned the child? Yes. Uh, so this child who had been taken care of like a princess by her father for years and years uh, was now at the mercy of Medicaid. Wow. And so obviously the thing to have done there was to create a will uh, that would have left everything to the daughter in a special needs trust. He would have named who the trustee of the trust would have been because that person would have a, then a fiduciary duty to make sure the daughter was taken care of. Um, the trust would have been able to pay for caregivers, different things like that, that would uh, supplement uh, any benefit that she may be on. And uh, she would be able to continue to receive care in the custom that she was uh, used to during her father's life. Uh, all that was destroyed just because, in this case, the father didn't take the necessary steps to protect the money for the benefit of his daughter. And, and specifically, the actions would have been like, there has to be a trust made in advance. 
and right. funded. Right. Right. Um, and then instead of leaving money to the wrong person, you would have left money to the trust. Right. Or the trust could have been created in the will. Either way, but but you would create the you would you would create a trust uh, for the benefit of the disabled child. <laughs> So what about the next case that you wanted to discuss? You called it spoiled to frugal by necessity. Ah, in this case, uh, we had an adult child who had never worked, so he didn't have the the, the credits to be, be on disability. So he was on SSI. Uh, he received a, a food stamp benefit and the, the normal Medicaid to go along with it. What most people do not realize that if a person is on SSI, if they receive cash from any other source, whether that be a parent, a job, if they get any more money on top of their SSI payment, they are supposed to report that. And their SSI payment will be reduced dollar for dollar the money they've received. So every time somebody calls daddy and says, can I have $20 for a pizza? Or can I have $100 to go to the beach? Or can I have whatever? That amount of supplemental income that they're getting from the parent should have been normally should have been reported and their SSI would have been reduced accordingly for the next month. And so if that if they find out about that, can that that mess up somebody's SSI? It could. Uh, I really don't know. I mean, I, I guess the only way you would find out about it if the person actually put money in a in an account that they had to, you know, yeah, I mean, re up with on, on their Medicaid benefit. And, in this and that day and age, you it. use um, cash apps, right? So the cash apps are going to report stuff like that. A lot of times, we've had that kind of thing happen just with us sending money to our kids in college, right? So, but what had happened? Uh, this this gentleman's father. Uh, paid for a lot of his monthly benefits. Um, He paid for his cable bill. He paid for internet. He paid for different things like that. When father died, (coughs) uh, there was a trust established, but it wasn't a special needs trust. Uh, Because in this case, the father went to a litigator to have his will done. Uh, And so the trust that the will did create was not very good. Well, it wasn't good at all. And it did nothing to shelter the assets. The second thing in this case was a bank was named trustee. Now, a couple of things about that. One, banks really don't want to be the trustees of special needs trusts because that that's not what they do. They don't want to deal with a child. They're not parents. Right, right. And second, in this case, there wasn't enough money in the trust to make it the bank's worth its while. Most banks have minimums, and that's understood. I mean, people understand that. Well, and and if a person a and a per, if a person came to us and wanted to name a bank, then we would tell them we need to check to make sure the bank is going to do this because they have a minimum requirement. But, but people, you also but, don't know who you're naming if you're naming a bank, right? And it, banks it can change. Is working for them at the moment, right? Banks can change, but but in this case. None of that was done. So daddy dies, bank refuses to qualify as executor and or trustee for this child. Uh, So they've asked us to serve, which we will. That's what we do. Uh, But we have now had to tell the child all of his monthly expenses are going to come out of his check because I'm as a fiduciary and, and as a lawyer, I'm not going to, you know, violate the SSI rules. So we're not going to be paying his internet and his cable bill and, and things of does, that nature. In this case, he did have enough money to be able to cover those expenses right. and more. Right. And but, we sat down with him and we explained the situation and he understands it. Uh, he has a rep payee to well, take care Daddy of his monthly his income. Rep payee. Right. And that was a huge issue and may still be. But that was a huge leap to have to... Well, you know, you, you get you get the thinking that a parent wants to help a child and that the parent will become the rep payee. And, and that I understand that totally. But there comes a point when that uh, disabled child becomes old enough, they need to wean off that parent and move to a professional rep payee or something of that nature. If for nothing else, 
to figure out the way of the world before mama and daddy die. Mm -hmm. Make Uh, sure you have a service that the parents like and trust as much as the child knows how to work the system while you're still able to guide them uh, in dealing with a professional rep payee service. Right. And a lot of times, another added benefit of these trusts, if the parent or grandparent create the trust, that's what's called a third party trust. Another person is creating the trust for the benefit of the disabled child. Mm -hmm. In a third party trust, that third party that creates it is also able to name who beneficiaries would be at the death of that disabled child, if there's any money left. If that money goes directly to the disabled child, as it did in our case, the best we can do then is create a first party special needs trust, which means the adult disabled person is creating the trust and therefore it's sheltered during their lifetime. It protects those public benefits, but at the end of the day, any money that's left in our case will go to the Department of Medical Assistance uh, to pay back the state uh, for some. We're discussing the difference between a third party and a first party special needs trust. If the adult parent or grandchild or grandparent or whoever it is, if they create the trust, that's a third party trust and they're able to direct where anything that's in the trust at the child's death would go. Other children, other grandchildren, they can direct that. If you don't plan ahead and we have to use a first party trust to protect the the child's assets, then they are protected during the child's life. But at the end of the day, at their death, anything that's left would go to the state to in an, in an attempt to pay back some towards what the state has paid on the, the person's behalf during their lifetime. So that's the big difference in planning ahead versus not planning at all. While we still may be able to shelter the assets, at the end of the day, the state is going to receive whatever is left instead of you being able to name who the beneficiary would be. So in, in, these, in both these cases, in, in the first case, the parent did nothing uh, but a POD designation, and we saw how disastrous that would be. And there was nothing that could be done. I mean, he named his sister as the, the payable on death. She took the money. She had no legal responsibility to do anything with it, uh, considering her niece. And therefore, there was nothing that could be done. In the second case, the gentleman had taken the steps to get these done, but he went to a litigator. Uh, the lawyer is a very good litigator, uh, very well known, very well respected, but he's not an estate planner. And, and one, he didn't create the, the, the correct trust. Uh, he named a trustee that he should have known was never going to take a special needs trust. And so it could have just worked out a lot better uh, if they had gone to the appropriate planning. And most of the time with a special needs trust, you're actually looking to go to an elder law attorney. Um, Elder law attorneys tend to focus on special needs trust and disabled adult children more so than the normal estate planner would be that's basically just doing trust in the states and things of that nature because it does take a specialized expertise to plan ahead for these. So what happens if you um, do nothing and you let your child inherit everything? Can they then take that money and put it in a special needs trust themselves? Well, the fear is the child is going to just get the money outright and begin to spend it. Then they would lose their public benefits because now they're over resourced. Yeah, I mean, if they inherit, you know, $80,000. Right. So they're over resourced. They're going to lose their public benefits. And then their entire inheritance is just going to be spent away. It's gone. Now they can go back on public benefit. In this day and age, most people, you know, some people have some cash. And then the majority of what they own is usually in their house or in property. And if you have a, a an adult disabled child, let's say, who doesn't have the ability to live at home. Like right. Specifically, in my case, we have mm-hmm. an, an adult disabled child in our family. Um, and so... We don't want that child to inherit anything outright. Correct. Um, But the majority of what would be left in my parents' estate would be the value of the house. Mm -hmm. So in that case, we've like given the adult disabled child a right to occupy. Right. A right to reside. A house. Right. 
Right. But, but they the own house no itself, legal interest. yeah, right. is owned by somebody else in the family. Right. They have no legal interest. Therefore, it's not their available resource. So it's not countable towards a public benefit. Right. You always want to structure these things. That's why you need to go to somebody that knows the field, that knows what to do. Because just because somebody, like in your case, just because somebody doesn't own something, doesn't mean they can't have the right to use it mm -hmm. or the right to utilize. Well, it. and you also have to to play into this as well about what age is this child? You know, like whether you have a child that's in their 30s or right. 40s uh, versus a child that's 62 when right. you may die. Totally you know, different. it's a totally different plan because a person who's about to be 65 has a whole different set of options than a person younger than that. Right. And and the, the, the big fear for someone that old is if they inherit outright, they're too old to create even a first party special needs trust. Uh, so that money's going to be spent. And, it, you know, you wouldn't know that if you're unless a, you went to somebody that had expertise. Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, because most people don't handle this sort of thing. So you really do have to go to somebody who is a boutique lawyer uh, right. who has studied it. So do you want to give us the wrap up of the three big mistakes that, that people made in these cases? Uh, going to a litigator uh, to, to get your, attorney. get your estate planning done. Uh, not creating the right kind of trust, which the, the first mistake led to the second mistake. And, in the, the, the first case we talked about, doing absolutely nothing, leaving the money to someone else, thinking they will do the right thing. I can't tell you how many times I've had that. I'll look at a questionnaire. A family has five children. On their, their residuary clause, they say they want to leave it to four. Mm -hmm. Undoubtedly, that fifth child has some sort of disability, and they're going to leave their share to a sibling knowing they'll do the right they're thing. They're going to do the right thing. Right. We hear that a lot. They'll do the right thing. Right. I totally trust them. And yeah, they might be a right. really great person, but... Oh, uh, you know, in one case, we had one lady which had nothing to do with a, a special needs trust, but she left her entire estate to the oldest son who was then supposed to distribute it to right. the children, <laughs> yeah. which then made him incur taxes and gift, right. you know, issues. He had his own issues then from distributing several hundred thousand dollars out of his estate then right. as a gift to his family, where it should have never gone into his name in the first place. Right. But the rep payee issue, I think, is something that really needs to make people aware because there's tons of people out there who have rep payees and they don't realize that if your rep payee dies, you're not getting your check. Right, exactly. They will stop that check. And that's another reason to maybe create the trust or get a professional ahead of time, rep payee service or ahead of time. The parent needs to get off the rep payee to have that adult disabled uh, child know how life is going to be after their death. Well, and, and like in our case, we, my mother was rep payee for a long, long time. And now my sister is rep payee um, just because she's younger than my sister. Right. So that way she's less likely to pass away first. So, you and know, if you, you go to an, pass it down. If you go to an experienced attorney, they'll help you work through all these issues. But How's like, the if income? you're named as a power of attorney on a, an adult disabled child, um, first of all, does that child have the right to even do a power of attorney? Do they have the mental capacity well, to do a power of attorney? According to their capacity. Right. Most do. Um, but if they do a power of attorney, power of attorney has no value in regard to uh, Social Security, right? No, you would you would go you would still have to go to the Social Security Administration and become rep payee. Yeah, so you know you can't just show up with your power of attorney and go I'm her rep payee. You've actually got to go show up and right. and have those people sign off right. and all that kind of stuff. You got to, but that is a huge delay. It can be if you're if you're if you're sitting at home and hadn't got a check in three months. Yeah, it took like three months for us to get <laughs> it handled. It was crazy because, of course, in that situation, not only did they not have the rep payee, but they also had named the bank. And so the bank then took a while to make a decision. And then we had to qualify. And then to be able to, we weren't even qualified then as executors, or you weren't qualified as right. an executor. We had no say so as rep payee. So right. that one's a whole different issue. Okay. It was great. It was fabulous. So go to someone that's well versed in these issues. Uh, if you have planning for children on public benefits. Cool. So we decided to videotape this at home. So I hope you enjoy the new view. Uh, <laughs> we have COVID. Ed. 
Yeah, we well, yeah. <laughs> we're in isolation. We're in isolation. So uh, we hope you all stay well and healthy and be sure to join us again for our next episode. 